All right, guys. So since you are here, I presume you already know a little about me. At least you have received either my email or you went to Blackboard. Have you seen my uh, syllabus on Blackboard, haven't you? You've seen some postings on Blackboard, have you? Yes. Yes, good. I'm just making sure because I never used Blackboard and I have uh, a sort of allergic reaction to such things. But uh, some, some of you are not responding through email. Maybe you don't see them. So I try to contact you any way I can. So the Zoom that we have today, that we have now, is a little bit different than the one we had uh, last semester. They have some bugs. It goes through CUNY. And I think there are some bugs. So for instance, you are joining right away without going to the waiting room, even that the waiting room was turned on. So I should be able to admit you. No trouble there, of course. Uh, so you have seen the syllabus, correct? So, but I will go over it just in case. So I am going to teach out of my notes, even though there is a textbook. It's single variable calculus, early transcendentals. You have a copy of that textbook on my website. My website is, by the way, Arkady, so it's aetkin.com. Do you know about it, right? Aetkin.com, here it stays. Okay, so you find all your materials there. The syllabus I keep separately. You see how this is divided here? I used to teach it at Hunter. So Calculus 1 and F150 is the code for it at Hunter, but it's the same thing. And the syllabi I store in a separate folder. Good. So first we are looking at the syllabus for this class. And this is the information you, you need to uh, know about it. Well, the expected uh, learning outcomes is roughly chapters two to chapter five in uh, the assigned textbook, in this textbook. So that goes all the way to integration. So we begin, we spend most of our time doing differential calculus and later we will learn integration, okay? And the grading policy will do will go through chapters two and three. That will be 30% of your grade. Chapters uh, three uh, to four, that's the 30% of your grade. And uh, the cumulative exam, chapter two to five, is 40% of the grade. Good. So that's the way the exam is scored. So final is worth a lot of points. Exam one and exam two will be take home. Final will be live. Okay, so it's easy to get 100 on exam one and exam two. It will not be easy to get 100 on the final. It will be under time pressure and that will be departmental. So this is the way the grade is made. Yes. So you can see how I assign the letter and the, that would be, this is this, the average score. In other words, I will just take this average. I will see what it corresponds to the scale and then I will assign your grade. So very important. Now this is a very important issue. Uniform final exams, as soon as possible, what you want to do is go to My Open Math. You go to this uh, website, myopenmath.com. You can just search for it. And one second. Yes, the finals will be uh, similar to last semester, it will be a lot of struggle. I actually have already lectures for Calc 1 posted from last semester and I have reviews for the final posted from last semester. So the final will be similar to what you saw last time. Good. Uh, so here is what you have to do guys. You have to open up an account with my open math and this is the course ID. And uh, you have to write my last name to register with me. Make sure to write this information and not your name. Otherwise you will not uh, see my class. Okay. You register, you have course ID and you write Etkin. I am not the person running the final exams and information about it will be given to you from Tell Professor me. Suzuki. So you sometimes will receive messages that are not from me. So you understand that there are several people that might uh, message you. I will teach you all this class, but the final and everything about it and how it's designed is not uh, something I take care of. Good. The final is worth 40% of your grade. Attendance. So I will verify your attendance this semester, both digitally and spiritually. In other words, I will see whether you are paying attention, whether you participate, whether you understand the material. 
And one way I would like to do that is for you to naturally turn your cameras on at all times. If of course it's very inconvenient, you're living in uncomfortable quarters, I truly don't want to pry into your private life or make you uncomfortable. The thing is uh, my good nature has been badly used a few, in a few classes uh, and uh, people decided to cheat on some of my exams and cheat on the final. And uh, I should tell you this, if you cheat on any of the first two exams, you will fail that particular exam. If you cheat on the final, you fail the, the full course. And uh, cheating is what? Cheating means that you post the exams on the internet or otherwise work in groups or copy it from someone. If you are having trouble with the questions, you can stay after class. And by the way, that's another encouragement. One major part of attendance uh, is that I encourage you to stay after class to discuss the material. The, if you discuss the material, if I see that you participate, I see what you are, it is much less likely that we will have some trouble with it, right? So people decided to uh, to not believe me, some of them, and uh, they cheated on the final exam. And uh, they, of course, some of them try to say they're innocent, but they don't understand uh, how silly it is that they do it. So you see, there is there are ways, digital ways to figure out who posted which questions, certainly, right? And uh, the department has those abilities. You might think you're smart, and maybe you will get away with it. But trust me, as soon as I see a good grade, I right away know that uh, you are a person that might potentially have been cheating or some inconsistency. I can see that pretty well. And I can also do another thing, which is done in Russia, and that is called oral exam. In other words, uh, here I give you a question and I see how you function. And that's the easiest way to know what your level is. If you, are, if you have anxiety before such things, make sure not to trigger any reason for me to carry such investigations, okay? Stay on my good side and we will be great friends. Okay, understood what about attendance? So not posting of any question. If you post a single question on the internet and I discover that, if I discover that, fail of that exam. If you, if you copy or post any questions on the final, you fail the, doesn't matter if you, if you could survive, you fail the class. Any, any one question, anything, any tweet about uh, any of the exam questions, you fail it. If you feel you're worried about the questions, you can talk to me, I'll help you solve them. But uh, don't seek other help. Do not, I mean, don't uh, pose those questions. Do not work with tutors on the spot. I discovered, well, the department caught six students in calculus in particular, and I caught another four, okay? and they all failed. And in the probability class, in my other class, I caught a lot of students. So don't do it. Good? Don't do it. And here you have an, uh, more of an overview of the class, uh, whether you want to stay or withdraw and especially recommendation letters. So. There are many people that email me uh, even many years after they were my students, many times I don't remember them and ask me for recommendation letters. And uh, if you want a good recommendation letter from me, you try to go beyond, above and beyond the, the subject. So for instance, uh, I have students that go and attend my probability course, and even though they're in calculus, then I can say a lot of good things about them. I, I see them, I know them, I see how much they are interested or trying there is a lot for me to say about them. So if you will ask for recommendation, I might, what I might do is I might test if you know the material still, okay? So I don't care for you just to pass this class. I want you to know the subject. I want it to be part of your thinking process, to be forever part of you. And if I see that's true about you, if I see that that's where you are going, I can write a lot of good things about you. So. Any questions about uh, about the syllabus, about grading, anything uh, I can help you with? I see some, somebody said, what if we can't stay after because we have... So uh, guys, you know that I have two sections of calculus, right? So if you want, if you cannot stay, I don't, you know, you don't have to stay. It's, you, know, you don't feel forced to do something you don't like. I, I hope you will enjoy it. I hope you will try to think about it. And I hope you understand that for the subject, it's, it's work intensive. You need to spend a minimum I would say of four hours uh, for every two hours. That, that's a minimum, right? Every two hours of lecture, you minimum have to spend four hours outside of class thinking about it. Much more is recommended. I would say 
a lot of extra uh, work after class or before class, we can do that. And I have another class. You have to understand there is flexibility. I, I sent you all three syllabi, right? So you know which classes I teach. You can come to my other calculus class. You can uh, view several lectures. You can, what can you do? Uh, yeah, you can view several lectures. You can go to several office hours. You can go to each office hour you find useful to. You can join at any time. Let's see. And if we need more office hours, yes, if you really want, or maybe some of you cannot stay after class, maybe I can uh, do the office hours before class. We maybe will vary it a bit. You see, sometimes before class, sometimes after class. We can see what we do. Uh, the, the important thing is uh, for you to try to spend as much time doing math as possible, right? And uh, when, you, when you get addicted to it, uh, you just do it naturally. It becomes a habit. Good? So no more questions about uh, the syllabus and that, and we can go and begin some information, yes? Good. So just a flavoring of what you missed, because uh, I don't think anybody in this class has come to my probability. No, I'm not true, one person was there, uh, was come to the probability lecture. Let me show you the beginning of a lecture that I had uh, last semester in August. The beginning of it, I will show you. Has anyone here thought about the questions I posted on in my email? You received my email. Have you thought about that, those two questions? It's okay. If not, we will, we will solve similar. Oh, that's good. That's good. So don't feel compelled to do anything, guys. Uh, but if you if you are interested in knowing where that might lead you, always a good idea to uh, look through more classes, look, uh, expand your understanding. So this is my lecture zero. And many people ask me, why uh, is mathematics useful? How is it useful in real life in particular? Of course, the more frequent question is, is it on the exam? You should know that when you ask me, is it on the exam? I get very annoyed because I, I, I understand it differently. I say, I say that you are telling me, I don't care about the subject and I just want to pass and receive a good grade. And uh, grades are meaningless without something to, su to support them. So, I will not go through the uh, full lecture if you're interested to know where it goes. Let me, uh, let me remind you, I asked you to watch 12 Angry Men. And the reason I asked you to watch 12 Angry Men is that if in this movie, you see that you have a group of jurors and they are all convinced in the guilt of uh, the defendant. And they are about to render a guilty verdict, except for one person who wants to re-examine the evidence. And as they re-examine the evidence, they see that uh, there is not so much that they understood. There is not, the, the case is not so slam dunk as they imagined, okay? And uh, to give you a, a, an idea of what that means, let me ask you those two questions that I asked in probability theory class. You are invited to a household known to have two children. You have never seen these children and have no prior knowledge about them. As you park your car, you notice that one child is playing in the yard and that she is a girl. What is the probability that both children are girls? What do you think? Simple enough question and uh, write in the comments what you might think about it. Okay, wonderful. We have 50%, many people say 50%. Okay, let's see. Come on, guys, come on. Okay. Well, and how convinced are you that you are correct? Many of you wrote 50%. How convinced are you? 100% convinced that it's 50%. Oh. Okay, well, here is a good example of probability theory or mathematics in general or reasoning being absolutely incorrect, right? So 
all of you, not a single person have answered this question correctly. It is not 50%. So the answer whether by 50% is one half. So the probability is not equal to one half. That's not true. Mm, oh, yeah, that's good. Gabby, maybe the girl is not uh, a child. Uh, by the way, guys, if you ever want to speak, you just uh, unmute your mic and you talk. That's also fun, right? I like to hear you and see your faces expressing something. So that's a possibility, but we, but it's not a trick question. The girl is a child from the household, right? I mean, you, you can have so many interpretations. That's a good one, but this is not what I mean. Uh, Tzvi, you say uh, 75%, incorrect as well. Okay, not right. So there are not, no, no uh, annoying tricks. 25% is not correct either, Karen. None of those answers are right. Now I will explain in a moment uh, what it is. Let me just explain that nothing in this question is, uh, I mean, no, nothing in the formulation of this question is tricky. I am assuming that each child is equally likely to be a boy or a girl, that there's no, uh, no you know, it's not more likely that a girl is born than a boy is born. And uh, the two children that you're sitting, do be, uh, that, that are here, this child that you're observing is part of the family, okay? Zero is not correct either. So let me now tell you what's the answer. And I will explain very quickly why that's the answer. So the answer is uh, one third. The probability is one third. Now, why is that one third? Because you are either observing the oldest child or the youngest child. So you are, when you do probability or combinatorics, you are looking at possible universes. Now. We have two children here and what are the possible universes? So one represents oldest, uh, two represents youngest. So maybe I am seeing uh, oldest, the oldest girl and I don't see the younger child. So maybe the younger child is also a girl. That's the desired outcome, both are girls. Or maybe I'm seeing uh, that the oldest is a girl but youngest is a boy. I don't know that, that could be this universe. Or I'm seeing that the that the oldest uh, is a boy and youngest, uh, the one that I'm observing is a girl. So I am observing, basically this is what happens here, right? And that's, uh, I will explain a bit more about it with the next question. But what's happening here is this, look at it. You are seeing part of the universe. You see, I covered my eye. You are either seeing the left eye, in other words, this is a girl, or you're seeing uh, the right eye, that's a girl. You're seeing either this or that, and you're wondering what is this? What is the full object? You're seeing part of the object, part of the universe. What's the full object, right? And, and you have three equally likely universes. One third represents what? One universe that is the desired outcome, two girls, uh, and they are out of three possible universes. You see what I'm saying? One out of three. Do you understand the explanation? It's meant to just be a flavoring explanation. Will order always matter in probability? Well, you see, the question is, what is it that you're counting, right? What you have to do in probability, you have to think very hard about the full universe or parts of it. If you saw the message that I sent you, uh, there was this very famous uh, uh, quantum mechanic physicist uh, by the name of uh, Hans Peter Dorr, is German, and uh, he proposed the theory in which pretty much matter is meaningless in a sense, right? There is no such thing as uh, matter, and everything is just a probability wave, right? Uh, the way you, you understand those ideas, well, uh, let me show you with the next example, and then you might, uh, let's see what you would say with the next example before I continue uh, with this discussion, right? So now suppose we have this situation, look at it now. Now the mother of that girl comes to the car and she talks to you and mentions, oh, this child that you're observing was born on Wednesday, on some Wednesday. Do you understand what I'm saying? The child was born on Wednesday. What is the probability that uh, both children are girls? Now. 
Okay, Joseph says one third. Go on, guys. Gian says one third. One third. Somebody said, uh, so this child that you're observing was born on Wednesday, but not on this Wednesday. I should have been more precise on a Wednesday, right? It's a Wednesday child. Maybe uh, for whichever reason that that came to be interesting. Maybe the mother is superstitious and thinks that there is something special about children born on a Wednesday. It's like middle of the week. In German, you call it Mittwoch, middle of the week, right? By the way, guys, you're all uh, very quiet and sad. You know, you, it's nice to hear your nice banter. So when you want to talk, you just unmute and talk. You're not facing your execution. So, you know, I'm just uh, a friendly neighborhood instructor. You don't believe me, I see. Probability students believe me a little bit more. But you, I guess you don't. <laughs> yeah, so? So it so it should still be one third then if I mean, if that if the if that detail makes shouldn't make any difference to the probability. Okay, so let's see how many people said one third. One third, one third, one third, one third, one third, one third. I had, uh, I think, what, six or seven replies. All of them said one third. Uh, everybody agrees uh, with the one third, guys? Uh, Tzvi says there should not be any difference. Everybody agrees? Yeah. So you are uh, my uh, 12 jurors, one per Francis says no, but uh, so I have a bunch of jurors and you all uh, seem to agree that we have an airtight reasoning here, right? Uh, okay, if older and younger uh, was counted into probability, then the day uh, the child was born should be accounted for, okay? Uh, so let me not, drag this any longer and tell you, my dear jurors, that you are absolutely, completely wrong. <laughs> you know what's the probability? The probability from this information is now 13 divided by 27. Yeah? You don't believe me, huh? You see what I'm talking about? So the word I couldn't remember yesterday when I was talking about uh, probability is that it is Probability is, I, I said, it is heimtuchig. It is um, <laughs> insidious. It is insidious. That's the best word I could find. You understand? It's insidious. It creeps up and it looks very simple and it's not simple at all. And what you imagine to be airtight reasoning is not airtight reasoning at all. Now, let me explain to you what is happening here. What, what is the mistake that you are all making? Why uh, do I have a sense at least, or maybe I'm absolutely incorrect, but I don't know enough about quantum physics. I actually began reading an interesting book about it, but I do not know enough to tell you, um, you know, to say that matter doesn't exist. It's, it's a meaningless statement to me to some extent, but I think, how do you um, come to such ideas? If you do probability, it's this, you see, I walk on the street and sometimes I don't feel that I'm any different uh, than a light bulb, right? So it's the, me and, the, and a metal piece of stupid dumb metal is, this, is just really part of the same, very same thing. It's a sort of idea that Spinoza, uh, Spinoza tried to, um, to describe is that God is uh, in us and around us in everything, right? So it's everything is just one object. It's just basically like uh, the girl, one girl is one eye, the other girl is the other eye, but they are part of the same face. And that type of thinking for sure is very useful in probability theory. Let me try to explain to you what you are counting here and why you made that mistake. You were focused too much on the girls and the children and not on the full universe. But uh, the fact that, uh, that when, when the mother mentions the girl was born on Wednesday, that fact is, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is something that makes the universe less potential and more definite, okay? 
more definite. Here is uh, essentially what information you now take into account. What are your universes? Simplified universes here, right? So I can imagine that X T Y S X is the uh, older child and T is the day that that child was born. Y is younger child and the day it was born. Okay. So the information that we now have is this. We now know that either I observed the oldest girl that was born on a Wednesday or the youngest girl that was born on a Wednesday. So this uh, vector of four entries is half complete. It's uh, oldest girl on Wednesday or youngest girl on Wednesday. How many possibilities, how many such universes are possible if mm -hmm. I just have those four factors? Well, uh, there are going to be for the youngest child, two possibilities and seven possibilities for the day of birth. We're assuming again, very simply that each day of birth is equally likely to be uh, any one day of the week. So Y S we have Y is um, two S is uh, seven. So two times uh, uh, seven is 14. And here we have additional 14 possibilities, right? Here we have additional 14 possibilities. Um, but there, there is an overlap. The overlap, I counted some universes uh, twice, and that is the universe uh, GW, GW, that they are both born on a Wednesday. I, because I mean, I can put in, when I, said, when I said here 14, one of the elements I counted, one of the universes are counted is where Y is G and S is W. GW, GW, are you following me? So uh, that, that's why what I do is I need to, uh, to take two times 14 and subtract one. Because uh, uh, two times 14, I count here, and here I counted the same universe twice. One universe was counted more than once. Why are we doing probability in calculus? Because it's a very good question. We're not gonna do it in calculus. It is first of all, an attempt to entice you to go to the other class as well, to learn some other ideas. And it is also because calculus is used heavily in support of probability. You see, I want you to see a sort of goal. And for me, that goal would be a sort of higher and philosophical understanding of, well, of things around me, right? It's, it just makes my uh, existence more complete and actually is important. If you, I'm not gonna go through this lecture, it's uh, a sort of contention that I don't have time for this semester, but uh, it is related. Those questions are related to the current situation and what you think and what you believe, right? Which I am not always happy about. Okay, so the answer here is two times 14 minus one, it's 27. I hope you understand why. And uh, the desired universes, the desired universes uh, that I need, to, I need to count is where I have two girls. Girl, uh, and one girl is oldest and born on Wednesday, the other girl, but I don't know the day of birth. Or maybe I am observing the youngest girl and the other is also a girl. So now, there are going to be two times seven minus one or 13 possibilities. And in particular, the probability is 13. There are 13 possible universes in which both are girls and uh, 20, uh, 27 of, uh, of just universes where I have a girl born on a Wednesday. Okay, so the answer is 13 over 27. So probability theory, if you, again, I'm not gonna continue with this lecture uh, uh, later, but you can see where, uh, where it will go. So you, if you were the jurors, if you are convinced, look at it, you make mistake in this situation, even though you do not care for the answer. You do not care what's the probability in this situation. It's not emotionally important to you. Now, and you make a mistake, even when it's not emotionally important to you. Can you imagine the mistakes you will be making when for whichever reason, by propaganda, or uh, by some sheer force of belief that you want something to be true. How biased you are, how unthinking you are. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe in science? I ask it uh, several times, so I just I want to know, do you believe in science? Would you put a sign in front of your house, say, I believe in science? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Okay, and when you put such a sign, you know what I think? I think you have no idea what science is because in science, you do not believe. In science, you think, you, uh, you have a theory and you argue for it. 
and when you say I believe in science, that's just a very dogmatic, blind type of mm -hmm. middle, uh, mid medieval uh, approach. It's like somebody, some expert told you something and you believe because that expert uh, is, well, you have to, first of all, you have to understand that you cannot in your mind grasp everything, but you have to discern what you take on belief and what you take uh, because you reasoned. In other words, maybe there's some belief there, but you reasoned it out. Uh, but many people do not do that. They don't discern uh, between what they know and what they believe. And that's very harmful, I think, overall, very, very harmful. Mm -hmm. It creates a lot of zealots. It creates a lot of people that are just unthinking drones and that are easily manipulated. So part of, and part of the, um, the idea of studying mathematics, and it's a very small part because I tell you, I, I noticed, that's the only thing I noticed that when I like something to be true, I am, my mind plays tricks on me. It's much easier for me to invent a soporific, to, to come up with a sleeping pill and just swallow it and believe it, continue to believe it, try to argue it away or try to dismiss evidence that goes against my belief. But I think it's very important to strive uh, to think non-linearly to understand that you see like here you said Wednesday does not matter many of you said Wednesday does not, does not matter for this question and you were absolutely wrong because you think about cause and effect you think very linear you think like this whereas what you have to understand that every every aspect right every aspect of your observation that the probability teaches you is part of the whole it gives you only it, it, it it's you are just a particular feature a particular zit on the face of the universe Right, and that's the the thinking that probability fosters. It's not like one thinking is correct as opposed to another. It's just that you are able to be flexible and move through different modes, and and uh, you get a sort of new sense in mathematics that you don't have from other subjects at all. It's it it sharpens your imagination. It makes you smarter, and that's one thing that I hope for this class is for you to be smarter, for you to be interested, for you to see something incredible. Good. And uh, if you're interested to know where that is going, I do not uh, uh, want to be busy with this lecture today. I will go and start teaching you calculus, okay? But if you want to know how I think it relates to um, today, to what happens today around the world, you are welcome to read lecture zero. And think of it whatever you like. Now let's talk about uh, the introduction to uh, limits now, okay? Uh, so, there was a very difficult number to understand that took many, many generations. And that number, you believe it, was zero. So, let me try to explain what that zero is about. So, you come home to your wife and she asks you, how many buffalo did you catch? Well, if you say you caught five buffalo, wonderful, you're a good husband, you're a provider, okay? <laughs> But uh, I am not particularly good at catching buffalo. So what would I have said to my wife? I cannot come to my wife and bring her no buffalo. So what I will do, I will bring her zero buffalo instead. And zero is not nothing. So here is what zero. Zero is a sort of mirror for any other expression. So zero plus X is X plus zero equals to X. That's true for all numbers for we're not going to unfortunately go deeply into number theory or into real analysis but those things are covered deeply and meticulously in higher subjects and i hope you will be interested i can show you of course eventually um you know what they do so zero plus anything is that anything that seems more or less clear to you it's ingrained in your thoughts right now could anybody tell me before i talk about it why zero times x zero times any number equals to zero so zero plus something is rather simple what is zero multiplied by something and uh, and why is it zero i mean you know it from elementary school but why is it zero Yes, nobody should be sure. In my class, you would be very unsure all the time. You would lose your confidence, but I hope for hopefully not in the wrong way. Okay. Zero, well, I actually said zero isn't nothing, but okay. 
you, but if you can't multiply, then it's mean, meaningless expression. All right. Let me show you at least algebraically what happens here. Okay, well, that's zero of that thing, maybe. So this is important to have a sort of understanding. Okay, guys, so zero times X, do you agree that if I write zero times X or zero plus zero times X, it's the same thing, yes? Same thing. So I can distribute the X to each of the zeros and I have zero times X is equal to zero times X plus zero times X. I'm doing a sort of algebra here. So if I subtract zero times X from both directions, look at it. Zero time, if I, if, I, if I take zero times X minus zero times X, whatever that might be, if I, if, I, if I remove something from itself, I get zero. So on the other side, although I have zero times X, look at it, zero times X plus zero times X minus zero times X. And it follows that zero is equal to zero times X. Do you understand? Uh, this, is, uh, this is relying on certain algebraic um, properties that you have for numbers, the distributive property if you want to, we can talk about it later on. And uh, the fact that uh, you can, uh, when, you, when you remove some, some quantity, if you take five minus five, you get zero. If you take seven minus seven, you get zero. And in general, if you take an entity minus itself, you get zero. Yes? So what I, I use this idea. So I use algebra to push the conclusion, even without philosophy somewhat blindly. So Tzvi suggested uh, some philosophy for that, but we can also do it blindly. We can just push something and uh, by the algebra, it should be true. If of course we verify all the steps in the algebra. Okay, I, it's important because I want you to understand why you cannot divide by zero. That's why I begin here. Good, so zero is equal to zero times X, clear? Now, division by zero is undefined. Why is that the case? Well, look at it, look at it this way. Uh, if I take five and I, I, there is a fraction, five multiplied by one fifth, multiplying by one fifth means just divide five into five parts. I will get one. Yes. Five multiplied by the reciprocal, it's five. It's so it's a, so it's one, right? Now, what would one divided by zero mean? So one fifth means something, means take a unit and divide it into five. What does it mean to divide one into zero parts? Well, if this were defined, zero multiplied by that expression should be equal to zero because zero times any number is zero. That's hopefully what we verified, okay? If zero times any number is zero, you see what I'm saying? Zero times whatever this expression is, if it's defined, it will be some number. So zero times any number, that's what we try to do here, is equal to zero. But zero multiplied by one over zero, it's supposed to be equal to one. If, if, if one over zero were to make sense, uh, zero times that expression should equal to one. So we cannot have it because that will imply that zero equals to one. And that's not true. So division by zero is undefined. If I, I'm, I'm hoping that it's not entirely confusing you yet, guys, right? I'm doing it rather fast and it's called semi-rigorously because I have to justify, uh, well, you have, you have to be a certain, uh, uh, of certain autistic disposition and justify every single step, right, to every single operation, uh, to know that uh, you know, what, you're, what you're doing is logically meaningful. But logically, one over zero is supposed to represent a number that when multiplied by zero gives you one, but a number multiplied by zero is always zero. So we don't have such a number, okay? And here we come to the problem that in fact, we do need to divide by zero. Even it's undefined, we need to divide by zero. Okay, and here is uh, the velocity problem of calculus. So you are presented with a video of a moving car and asked to determine the speed of this car as it passes the traffic light. Do you understand the, the question? So you have a video, this is a roll, the camera is, uh, is, filming, is filming what's happening here and this car is moving. And the question is, uh, and the question is how would you verify the speed of this car when it passes the traffic light. So anybody would suggest them, it's not a very complicated procedure. What would you have done if that was your task? You're not in the math class, but you are just, uh, you have this recording and you have this time lapse on YouTube and you need to verify how fast is this car traveling? What would you have done? Any, anybody knows? 
Anybody has an idea of what they might have tried to do? Uh, measure the distance between the stoplight and where the car started from. Uh, that's a good, okay. So distance divided by the time, that gives you though, uh, because notice when you drive, sometimes you drive very fast, sometimes you slow down, right? So that will give you what, they, what is known as average. Uh, average speed, but average speed is not the speed at which you're moving exactly at the moment of the traffic light, okay? So let me try to, but that's what you're saying is good. It's very good. It's a good beginning, All right? So uh, here, imagine that to make it more concrete, are you, are you there guys? To make it more concrete, imagine that those are observations that you were, uh, were able to make. So XT, let's look at it. This is the bar at any moment of time t, let's say when t is equal to two, the car is at five, right? When t is equal to two, the car is at five. Imagine this is what you have obtained. Let's see if you can figure out a formula for the uh, function of time of the car. This is the way the car is moving. At zero, the beginning of the video, the car is in position one. You see that? So this is measured, I don't know, in in kilometers or in meters, whatever you like, right? Maybe it's in, in, in meters, okay? So, so time is measured in seconds, uh, the x-axis is measured in meters. So at zero, the car uh, is uh, one meter uh, away from uh, this position. This, this is your zero mark, okay? At one, it is at two units. At two seconds, it's at five units, at three seconds, it's 10 units. Can you come up with, uh, Based on this, can you guess what might have been the formula for X of T? Oh, you're quick. So, uh, uh, Rin, very quick, and Joseph, good. Okay, so uh, it seems that, you see, it, it might not be the, the correct, uh, there is no, no, it's impossible to determine, of course, based on this information precisely, but you might guess it does, it does fit the pattern of uh, X of T being equal to t squared plus one. Do you agree? Look at it, zero squared plus one is one, one squared plus one is two, two squared plus one is five, three squared plus one is nine. So t squared plus one definitely fits this pattern. Do you agree? Guys, do you understand uh, what this expression is saying? Uh, in terms of yes. a function, we transform time to position. So basically at a, diff at a given time, there is a position. Is it clear? Very important for this to be clear, guys. It's, a, it's an idea that, well, the, you, you drag the toolbar, the time toolbar, and you see where the car is located. Clear? Okay. Gabi, it makes sense still? Okay, guys, you understand what's, what's happening here, yes? So you, see, you see this toolbar, you imagine, I, I should have of course made an animation, I have done some animations, but uh, this I was too lazy to do. Yeah? Do you see what's, what's happening? You drag this time bar and Notice if, if, if I were to hold this, you see this is this red cursor is where the time bar. At zero, I see that the car is at one. And then I, uh, uh, I move the cursor to here to two. And this car, can you imagine, will be dragged and it will move, it will be here. I would see that at two, it's exactly at five. You see what I'm saying? So that means any given moment of time corresponds to a unique position for where the car is located. Yes? Do you have any questions, guys? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying so far, right? I want to be sure. You have such tired faces, most of you. I understand it. Good. Good. So this is our, uh, our function. Yes, Robert. It is a function t squared plus one is a good representation for it. 
And uh, now we are going to try, once we have this function, we're going to try to determine what's the velocity. So let's say the traffic light is in position five, you see? So we're interested in the velocity when the car was at five. By the way, remind me, this class is over at 3.30, correct? I don't remember yes. when, yes, right? So we have 30 minutes. 3.30. Good. So velocity is change of position divided by change of time. That's what velocity is. Do you, you understand what, what's the idea of velocity? What you're doing is you, you track in a given, when, when, it's, when something is moving constantly, right? So what you do is, let's say, let's say I can jog uh, one mile in, uh, yes meter per second, right? So let's say, let's say six miles per hour, right? So let's say I jog six miles per hour. What does it mean, right? It means that in two hours, I will jog 12 miles, right? If, if it's constant speed. In three hours, uh, it will be 18 miles, right? In half an hour, I will jog three miles. Good, well, derivative we haven't yet studied, uh, Robert. We will talk about it, right? Uh, once we get there. Do you understand guys? So you have to understand the concept, the concept of velocity, first of all, right? Is that you, you measure some regularity. In other words, what are you trying to say? You're trying to say how much distance is covered per given amount of time. So if you jog six miles an hour, then in one hour you travel six miles. In two hours you travel 12 miles. In half an hour you travel three miles, yes? In a third of an hour, you, co you cover two miles, good? The ratio is, uh, is staying to be six per one hour. You understand that the idea of a fraction there, right? So that's, that's how you try to capture the idea that the motion is regular. Of course, the motion is not at all regular uh, when you are moving, right? You sometimes speed up, sometimes you slow down. Do you agree? So regular motion, it's very easy to calculate velocity for. When you, when, you, when you do distance divided by time, you always mean regular motion. In other words, where you never speed up or slow down. What do you do uh, when uh, you do have to uh, speed up and slow down? So for example, I know that uh, the car passes the traffic light when t equals to two, at two seconds. So the, when, when the video is running at two seconds, you can press pause here, the car is uh, at the traffic light. You understand? So I'm interested in the speed of the car at two. Now, let me ask a very simple, or maybe not as simple at all, but uh, a, question, a question about uh, speed. Now you play the video, right? I play a video and uh, at two, I press pause. I pause the video at two and the car is here. Do you understand what I'm saying, guys? I pause the video. When I pause the video, does the car have velocity? Is it moving in some sense? And what indicates it? You see, my question is slightly vague. Obviously, when I press pause on the screen, the car is not moving, right? But uh, I am asking a sort of legal question. You understand? I'm asking, is the car, before I, I, I elaborate, let me just continue with that vague question. And I ask you, is the car moving when I press pause? So I press play the car and then I wait for the time to reach two. You see the time is reaching two, the car is traveling to five. I press pause at two, is the car moving? Okay. So I see uh, Jahin says no, and uh, Noshin says no. And once people get comfortable, some people begin to say no, right? Uh, once, once others uh, think like them. No, so a bunch of people say no. Some people say yes. It's still a somewhat vague question. Yes. Well, let me then not 
drag it. And uh, if, if you said no, my God, you have invented a very good argument against, uh, against traffic tickets. So when you're caught uh, by a speed camera, you're gonna say, but, uh, but officer or, uh, or whoever you complain, right? I was not moving. You can see clearly in the picture, the car is stationary. <laughs> right? No, I mean, that's not going to be an argument that uh, the traffic bureau accepts. Now, why do they, do they not accept it? Right? So the car, in a sense, is still moving. In other words, in the universe, you see, I pause this universe, but the universe, if, the universe uh, indicates that this car is moving. And yeah? the video indicates that the car was actually moving. What was indicating that? Can you tell me? <clears throat> Have you driven cars, right? What indicates that the car is moving? Well, change in position. Uh, what in the car indicates that it's moving? When you take a photograph, uh, there is a blur. That's a good idea. But if you take a very good resolution photograph, there will not be a blur. Speedometer. The speedometer indicates that the car is moving. You understand? If there were a camera inside of the car, the speedometer will show something. The blur, it's true, but only when you don't have enough frames. If you if you have many frames, then you will not see any blur, right? If you if you have let's say a, a camera capable of filming, I don't know, a projectile, you know, high velocity cameras, you will not see any blur. Maybe there'll be other indicators of motion, but. Uh, there is a speedometer, right? There is, there is always a speedometer. Even if you actually break it, there is always in nature a speedometer. At least that's the mechanics view, understand? Something in nature will indicate the speedometer. Something will be akin to that arrow on the dashboard that shows you how fast you were moving. Do you understand? So when I want to know uh, velocity, instantaneous velocity, in other words, what's the velocity when I pressed pause at two, I want to know I want to know what is the speedometer pointing to. Are we clear? Do you understand? So the camera is, the, my problem is this, my camera is not inside of the car. I mean, I recorded the motion outside of the car. So my goal when I ask what's the instantaneous velocity, I want to know how fast the car is moving at that moment, how, what is the speedometer pointing to? And how would you try to calculate it, guys? So one, uh, one suggestion was already given to us, right? I can take change of position divided by change in time. Somebody said it, I don't remember who, but somebody already said that. So I can evaluate the function at two. In other words, that's when the car is at the traffic light minus uh, the position of the car at the beginning divided by the difference in time. So far good? You have uh, very poker faces, guys. Your faces are like you're playing poker, but like you don't enjoy playing poker. So, numerator is five minus one, denominator is two. And my answer is two. Is that what the speedometer are pointing to? What do you think? Is this a good estimation? First of all, guys, I need to hear from you. Do you, uh, do you think, do you understand uh, why that might be a good uh, beginning approach? Why might we do that? Velocity, velocity is just this idea that if something is moving at a constant rate, all I have to do is uh, just uh, note an interval of time and see how much distance was covered in that interval of time. Do you understand? Do you agree that that's a good uh, way of measuring uh, or relating different motions, if they are constant motions, by the way? You understand the word is constant, because if it's not constant, it's not uh, really clear what that, that uh, means. Okay? Clearly, yes. You see, guys, it's constant, right? Uh, it is how fast does it take uh, a given object to travel this distance? Right, so when you take ratio, you, you standardize uh, the comparison, right? Because for example, uh, you see, it, 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 if you said uh, I traveled 10, uh, 12 miles or I traveled half a mile, that is not an indication of speed because I do not know what was the unit of time that it took me to carry this distance, right? 
if I standardize the unit of time, in other words, if I have per second, how much did I move per second? Then that gives me an estimate of what's faster, what's slower. Good, so that's what I'm doing here. I notice that in two seconds, the car has moved from position one to position five, a total distance of five minus one or four over two, right? Four over two means two meters per second. Yes, if it's constant, it, it moved. In other words, if it's constant, I'm predicting the car is moving two meters per second. My next question, is it a good estimate of the velocity of the car when it passes the traffic light? Is it what the speedometer pointing to? All right, let's try another interval to verify that, right? So let's now measure the displacement between uh, uh, one second in the video and two seconds, right? So X of two minus X of one. Remember what is X of T? X of T is T squared uh, plus one, right? So it would be what? It would be X of two is five. X of one is one squared plus one. So it's two, so it's five minus two, it's three and two minus one is one. So now we have that if I um, measure the distance shorter, if I measure it between one second and two seconds, uh, the average velocity is actually higher. You see? So it's not a constant velocity. Otherwise we would have had the same number. So now the answer is three. So velocities don't match. And that means the car is not undergoing uniform motion it's uh, speeding up most likely, right? Or at least between one interval and another. Exactly, it's, it's accelerating. The car is accelerating because if, if it were at the same rate, any two different moments of time, I would compare the distance traveled, it will be the, the ratio of distance divided by unit of time will be the same. Yes? Okay. So the question is, uh, do we have a velocity at two and what is our uh, philosophy to attain it? Okay, notice what's, what's happening is this guys, you, you have this conflict. If you give any duration of time, in that duration of time, you can speed up or slow down, which means you can accelerate. Do you see that? If you, if you give any amount of time, the velocity can change because any amount of time, no matter how small, allows a certain amount of change to take place in anything, right? In a few seconds, I get older. But if, you, if I froze time, I will remain the same age. And that's true about anything. Anything undergoes change in some amount of time, albeit small amount of change if you allow very small amount of time. Very often imperceptible amount of change. Good. And, and that's what we, uh, we try to understand here. So look at it. Why do we need to divide by zero is this. You see, we can first reason the following. We can see that if I, if I did not allow any duration of time to elapse, in other words, if I try to, to compare the distance between uh, uh, two seconds, the, the position at two seconds and at two seconds divided by the time, it took to travel from that same second to itself, then that uh, will not allow any change. And perhaps if I could carry out this ratio, I would have uh, my velocity. I will have a, the exact velocity. Let me again try to explain what, what the those formulas talking about. Guys, how would you have truly calculated the velocity by the traffic light if you had to estimate it? Here is what I would have done. I would have, uh, I would have uh, selected a mark where the car uh, is, is going to be stopped, at two it's gonna be stopped. So let's say 
I quickly press play on the video and press pause. You understand? Press play and press pause. Or you can just simply drag the, if you don't want to press play or pause, just drag the uh, cursor. So between this point and that point, there is little time. And I can measure uh, the displacement, the difference in position divided by difference in time. And uh, that would be one estimate of velocity. And then I can slide closer. And that would be another estimate of velocity. Notice that uh, if I have uh, the time interval very short, philosophically speaking, very short time interval allows for very little difference in uh, very little change. You understand? So the idea is that if, of course, the time was entirely, uh, not, the time was, was completely zero, the difference in time was completely zero, there will not be any change. But if time is, but, but then the problem is if I do that, I get zero over zero, you see? I get zero over zero. You understand what I'm saying, guys? I, I hope you are still with me, guys. So if I don't give any time, there, there is no change, but also I have division by zero, which is not allowed. So, but somehow still I want to divide by zero. So what's my idea? My idea will be this, that I will select a time very close to two. A time very close to two, and that will allow very little change, uh, change in velocity. And then my estimate is hopefully very good. So I would measure smaller intervals. Do you understand the philosophy here? Uh, practically speaking, smaller and smaller intervals. The smallest interval I can measure and hope that the smallest interval I can measure allows very little change in time. You understand? And if it allowed very little, uh, sorry, allowed very little change in acceleration, the velocity was essentially uniform on that interval. And I can just uh, calculate the average velocity of that, over that interval, which by the way, average velocity, so that we can explain why it's called average later in the course. For now, it only means constant velocity. You understand? If I give less than, if I give a hundredth of a second for you when you're running, if I give you, if I press play and stop on the stopwatch one hundredth of a second, most likely you could not change your speed in that amount of time, right? It's, it's a very short duration. So your speed was the same throughout the duration of this uh, time. Yes. And of course, I want it as, as close as possible. I want a sort of uh, imitation. So here is what I do initially. Look at it. This is my suggestion. So uh, I want the velocity at two because two seconds in the video, that's where the car passes the traffic light. That's where my speed trap has to be activated. Yes. So I will select t hat. t hat is a fake two. You understand? I cannot divide by two minus two, but I can divide a fake two minus two. That means t hat is, is a number, it's called infinitesimal, uh, infinitesimally close to two. In other words, it's a number that's a very, very good imitation of two, but not actually two. It's that number, maybe it's 1.9999. It's very close to two. Good? It's, it's ideally close to two. So then I do this, uh, I carry out this operation and look what I observe, guys x of two hat minus x of two is two hat squared plus one minus two squared plus one. When I subtract it, I have two hat squared minus two and the denominator is two hat minus two. Now, do you remember how to factor the difference of squares? Yes, you factor the difference of squares. Yes, and what, and you can cross it out. You can cross that zero, it disappears. Look at it. Two hat minus two, it's a fake zero not a true zero, so I can still divide by it. So I factor it out, two hat minus two, cross out with two hat minus two, it's one, and I just have two hat plus two. So my estimate of the actual velocity when I pass the traffic light to be four meters per second. Yes? You follow? Guys, you remember how to, uh, to do foiling, just uh, uh, to be sure? You remember this, right? You remember you have, let's say, x squared minus four, right? So uh, what you have is, this is the same as x minus two, x plus two. You can clearly see if you foil it out, you can just go here and here. So you have x squared plus two x, and then minus two x minus uh, two squared, which is uh, x squared minus four, right? So that's how you foil uh, difference of squares. We will have to learn in this class how to do that for n powers, not just uh, square, but what do you do 
uh, when you need to factor out x cubed minus eight, for example. So for example, we would need to know how to factor out x cubed minus eight, or maybe x to the power of four uh, minus uh, 16 maybe, for instance, right? We will need to know how to do those factorizations, but that's later in the course. So what I want to say is, look at, look at it. Uh, it's important, it's important to uh, cross something out, right? And then we, d we eliminated that zero problem, division by zero, and we have that uh, the answer is four. And if you do this experimentally, you will see that the speedometer is most likely showing four. I mean, if, if, you, if you actually could put a camera inside, you would see that the speedometer will show four. I hope you're amazed. I mean, your, your faces do not uh, show such great amazement, but... Mm. So, this is the situation in general. Uh, well, velocity is the exact number to which the speedometer is pointing uh, Christiana, okay? So what we do, we, we just have this approach because look at it, uh, strictly speaking, we need to divide by zero. The idea is that if no time elapses, there was no change and the velocity was constant, but I cannot extract the velocity from this expression because zero over zero, division by zero makes no sense. Understand it, it's, it, it, the arithmetic fails. So my attempt to get at it is by approximation, is that uh, I select two hat very close to two so that the distance between those two numbers is infinitesimally small. And this allows me this trick of crossing it out and uh, simplifying to four. Because two hat is, is basically, what is two hat? Two hat is a number, it's this interval. You see, we, we, we made an error when we selected zero and, and two, there are big distance between them. But as I narrow the distance to two, let's say this is 1.9999 or whatnot, more and more I narrow it, uh, there is less and less time between uh, two hat and two. And that means that uh, there is little change that could have happened between those terms. You see, very little change in, in speed and philosophically that, that's why uh, we expect that to be true, right? Very little time means that there is very little change. And that depends of course on the phenomena studied. Less and less and less and less time, less and less change, right? It is cheating. Uh, well, not, not exactly, right? I mean, it, it's, it's involving what idea? It's involving some things that you know about life is that uh, with little amount of time, there is very little change. With a lot of time, there is a lot of change, yes? So if you make time unimaginably short, uh, in that short duration of time, there was no change in velocity. This, the, the car was not speeding up or slowing down essentially, right? In other words, it, it, it's deviation from constant speed are trivial. And so we will get that the answer strives to be, uh, to be four. It's striving to be four. Yes? And uh, this, is, we're gonna, this is a preview, this is called derivative. So we're gonna study first limits, which is uh, an easier topic, and then we will talk about derivatives. So that's a preview of it, but that's the easiest physics questions you have, right? They always involve velocity, they always involve calculus. Good. And this is the general situation. Look at it, guys. I can construct a velocity function. I can construct a velocity function, x of t hat minus x of t, t hat minus t. So that's the velocity function at any time t. I can reconstruct what the speedometer was showing even though I don't have a direct view of it. So for this function, it's t hat squared plus one minus t squared plus one divided by t hat minus t. We simplify it out, cross out, we have t hat plus t equals to 2t, yeah? So we predict that the velocity is always going to be the, uh, twice the time. So in other words, the velocity at zero will be zero. The velocity at one will be two. The velocity at two seconds will be four. The velocity at three seconds will be six or anything in between, you understand? We predict that the velocity for this particular car uh, will be always twice the time of the video. You understand how I did the prediction? I just calculated velocity for all time. So now I can actually uh, have this video and create a digital speedometer that shows how fast this car is moving at any moment of time by this trick. Now uh, it is 
your turn. I'm not sure if we have full time for it, but uh, uh, your turn. So a particle moves so that its position at time t is given by xt equal to minus 40 squared plus two. Okay, that's the position in time. Let's say it's verified somehow. Your goal is to find its velocity as a function of t. Do you understand what I'm asking? I'm asking you to construct the velocity, the speedometer for any moment of time for that particle. Here is a picture, you see? The particle is moving on the x-axis. Uh, what is the speedometer where the particle is located at the, at the moment t? At t equal to one, the particle is at minus two. The speedometer is pointing to something. What is the speedometer pointing at any given moment of time? Okay, try to carry out the calculation. Let me know uh, what you think might be the answer. From first principles, some of you might, be, might have taken calculus before. I want you to do it from first principles, like I did it uh, for the previous example. It's not a technique that you memorize that matters to me, but do you understand the idea? Okay, three answers, uh, okay. Ah, yes, uh, we'll talk about a few tips about getting an A in this class. One of them is you, you might be joining our what, when, where team. You, we are gonna play what, when, where, right? In office hours, maybe one question at a time. I'll show you what it is. The other is of course, uh, it, you try to, to understand the concepts. All right, so uh, two people, and guys, by the way, so, uh, so okay, we have a few people that, uh, that have an answer for it. Um, for lack of time, we will go over it, but you see guys, we can solve these questions very slowly, right? So that you solve it on your own in office hours. That's the benefit that you can just talk to me. I can see where you are stuck. If there is anything like that, I can help you. Okay, so here is that picture. Okay, guys, so we know that uh, my function is x uh, of t. What is x of t? x of t here is minus 40 squared plus 2. Okay, so that means that uh, if you tell me a moment of time, take the square of that moment of time, multiply by minus 4, and add 2, and you will get the position of the particle at that moment. So here it is, right? So we have x t hat minus x of t divided by t hat minus t. Here is the numerator. Right, basically at this moment of time, we have minus 40 hat squared plus two, subtract this moment of time and divide by t hat minus t. Yeah. And what do we get? And uh, when we simplify everything, we get minus four t hat squared minus t divided by t hat minus t, factor it out, cross it out. And what do we have? We have uh, minus 40 hat plus t, which what? The t hat and t are now very similar. So that would be essentially the same as 2t times minus 4, which gives us minus 8t. So my prediction is this, is that velocity is always going to be minus 8 multiplied by the time. So at 0 seconds, the car is not moving or the particle is not moving. At, um, uh, at let's say, 2 seconds, the car is moving at minus, it means moving to the left. 
uh, minus 16 meters per second, let's say. Good? So this is again, what is t hat? We're gonna change notation for it later on. t hat is, it means nearly t. It means that this is the time that's very close to t, okay? That's the essential part of it. And uh, here again at one, it's minus eight. It's obvious, right? Once you solve it for all numbers, it's obvious what it is for uh, number one. All right, guys, so am I correct to assume that uh, class is over at uh, 3.30, right? Again, right, I think I am, right? I just don't want to finish earlier. Yes, okay, so I'm gonna stop recording.